Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be free? When the world is coming into gross darkness, you and I can be set free from those chains of bondage and we can walk in the light. Glory to God. Open your Bibles, if you would, tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, our main text we've been looking at now for quite a while, talking about the subject of the spirit of faith. And here recently we've been talking about the different kinds, different kinds of faith. And we know faith is important. God loves it when his people are in faith. He said, Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So it's important that you and I be in faith, particularly in these last days. We have a lot of things that we're seeing that we've never seen before. It feels a little strange, a little odd to us. And so we're, our faith is being challenged like never before. But once again, we're going to look to the Word and act on the Word and be set free. Notice if you went 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. The Holy Ghost through Paul writing to the church at Corinth. The Christian believers there, spirit-filled believers. And he said in verse 13, We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. And here's the, here's the operation of the spirit of faith. He said, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. And so it wasn't just the Apostle Paul. I'm glad the Holy Ghost told him to say or write the rest of this because if it stopped right there, then somebody would have come up with the teaching. Well, that was the Apostle Paul. And, you know, the Apostle Paul was greatly and mightily used, and he was. And so he had it, but we don't know. Read on. It starts out, we having, so we have it. The Apostle Paul had it. And notice the Lord is reiterating again. It's not just the Apostle Paul, but we also have it. He goes on to tell us, he said, we also. Everybody say, we also. Come on, everybody say, we also. And so we have to remind ourselves about it. We also believe. Do we have any believers in here tonight? How many, of you have the, how many of you have faith in God tonight? How many of you are believers tonight? Glory to God. So you have it. You believe it. Glory to God. He gave us the measure of faith, the day of salvation. He said, we also believe, talking to obviously himself and to them at the church and to you and I, we also believe and therefore we speak. Go to Romans, Romans chapter 1, and we're seeing that it's good to have faith and to believe, but then there has to be some action, and that action is what I believe in my heart. Bible faith comes from your heart, not your head, not your feelings, not your intellect, not the way you think it is. Bible faith comes from your heart that you got from hearing the Word, and it got down in your spirit. When it gets in your spirit, then it needs to get out of your mouth, come out of your mouth and speak it. Notice here in Romans, the first chapter, verse 16 and verse 17, once again, the Holy Ghost of the Apostle Paul, these are not just Paul's words, but they're the Holy Ghost words that he wants Paul to speak to them and to write down for all of us to read and write and grow by and to learn by. He said, and for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Is salvation available to everyone? Is salvation available to everyone, church? Absolutely. Say that with me. Salvation has been made available to who? Church? Everyone. But now notice, how do we get in on it? To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, or we could say, and also to the rest of the world. So salvation is not only to the Jews, but it also is for everyone. And notice, how do we get in on it? By faith or by believing. So we've been looking at the subject. Go back, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, we've been looking, and we're on the second one on different kinds of faith. We looked at great faith, and of course, I think all of us want to have great faith, but great faith doesn't come automatically. Uh, I heard a minister one time say that great faith comes from great battles. So we have to understand that when you hear the Word, everybody say, when I hear the Word, you have to understand this. Jesus taught in the parable of the sower, and he said, it's, he said if you don't understand this parable, then how are you going to understand the other? So we could say that this is probably a, the primary parable that we need to understand because it's important because it's what happens, what do people do when they hear the Word? How do they respond to it? And we found the very first type of individual that hears the Word is the wayside individual where their ground is hard. And we see something that the enemy comes to steal the Word immediately. Everybody say, the enemy comes to steal the word 
immediately. Now, you understand he doesn't have to be allowed to do that, but when people don't have any reverence for the Word, the Word is not a priority, the Word is going forth, and if they're not hungry and they're not receive it and they don't hold fast to it, then what happens? The enemy will come and steal it. So make sure the Word is always a priority in your life. If not, the enemy, I believe I said this last Wednesday, many Christians are getting robbed at church from the enemy because they're not holding fast to the Word that they've heard. And so without the Word, then you have no shield of faith. And without the shield of faith, you have no protection. And with no protection, you're easy game. Everybody say, I'm easy game. Well, that's not the plan of God. The plan of God is for you to take the armor, to take the Word of God, to take the blood of Jesus, to take the name of Jesus, to take the anointing, use all of that equipment that He has given you. Everybody say, i got to use it. And see, if you're not conscious about it, not aware about it, don't apply it in your life, and you're not using it, and what happens? Then when the enemy comes, a lot of times we're kind of like the individual praying, like Paul was over in 2 Corinthians. He said, Paul said, I prayed unto the Lord three times about the same situation, and notice God didn't do anything about it. Why didn't he do anything about it? Because God had already done something about it concerning the devil. He delegated his authority to the believer. And I think sometimes when we read the letters, you know, of Paul and the other new epistles, we think that, you know, these guys were all known. And yet Paul said in Philippians, he hadn't arrived. But now we take everything and we begin to read it. Then we begin to go over to the book of Ephesians, which was written later. Now he understands his authority. Now he understands and he has more revelation. Just like wherever we're at today in Christ. Five years from now, we should have greater revelation. Five years from now, we should have greater understanding. Five years from now, our faith should be greater than what it is today, and yet we still haven't peaked out, but it's good to grow. Everybody say, it's good to grow. So notice we're talking about the subject of great faith, and so we find an individual who is not a Jew, which I remember, and I know I've shared this before, but it bears repeating because since I've shared that with you, I was listening one day to this professor teaching about healing and tongues, and he was teaching people that only healing and, and speaking in tongues were for the Jews, and we know that's not scripturally true. But once again, we have professors teaching these things in college courses. And like I heard one minister say, he says, sometimes these students are going hungry for the truth, and they're being educated deeper into ignorance because they don't know the Bible. And so, here is a Roman soldier. Everybody say Roman soldier. And so notice something here about the Roman soldier. And we find the reference, if you would please, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, if you would please. Uh, and let's go to uh, verse 5, the, the centurion. And Jesus talks about his great faith in verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a, a, a centurion beseeching or begging him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. Everybody say, speak the word only. Notice he's coming on the behalf of somebody else, on his servant, and he said, I will come and heal him. And the centurion says, no, I don't want you to do that. Just speak the word only. Notice we want to have great faith. Great faith is always going to be based on the Word, not on the situation, not on the circumstance, not on the condition, but it's going to be based on the Word. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the Word only, and my servant shall be, what church? Shall be healed. So all I need you to do is you just speak the Word, speak the Word that he's healed, and he shall be healed. Notice this man believes what Jesus spoke. And he said, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. In other words, in all of his travelings and teachings up to this point in Israel, this guy had the greatest faith that he had found. 
we see one indicator of great faith. One indicator of great faith is what? Basing your faith on the Word of God. We looked last week. We finished. Go back to the Gospel of John chapter 20. We found a man by the name of Thomas. Jesus had already been resurrected. The disciples, they had uh, seen him, but Thomas didn't see him. And Jesus kind of reprimands him because his faith is based on seeing. And we find the centurion, he could have had Jesus come to his house, which I think a lot of us would say, yeah, absolutely. But notice this man said, I'm a man under authority. I believe what you say. He understood the authority of the Word of God. And you and I have to, if we're going to have great faith, because you're going to have opposition in your feelings. You're going to have opposition in the mental realm. You're going to have opposition in the natural world that's going to oppose your faith. It's going to look like the Word of God is a lie. The Word of God is not going to come to pass. But remember Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied by the Spirit of God. God said to tell the people that my Word will not return to me void. He said, that which I send it to, what did he send it to? He sent it down to earth. He said, it will profit. In other words, it will come to pass. God's Word will come to pass if we will stand our ground. But we're believing circumstances. We're believing situations. We're believing conditions. And our faith has to be based on the Word and the Word only. So notice if you would, in John chapter 20, we find Thomas. Many times we call him Doubting Thomas. But he did get it together. And notice in verse 24, he said, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will not, what church? I won't believe. In other words, his faith or his believing is based on the seeing. Our faith has to be based on what God has given to us, the written word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but this word will not pass away. This is the strongest, most authoritative word you are going to get in the universe. God is watching over it. He'll bring it to pass. But he needs somebody to grab a hold of it. He needs somebody not to. You're going to see circumstances. You're going to hear things. You're going to have feelings. And the longer you live in life, you're going to have experiences many times that are going to be in opposite direction to what the Word says. But you're determined to choose the Word. You're going to have to stand on the Word of God. Everybody say, stand on the Word of God. I remember one minister saying when he was believing God for something, now, you understand when I'm talking about standing on the Word, I don't mean literally putting your Bible down and standing on the Word. When I say standing on the mirror, I mean you've got a hold of the Word of God and you're not going to get off of it. Ephesians says, having done all to stand, what church? Stand. Well, he means literally standing on the Word. Why? The Word is the solid ground that you can stand on. It's unshakable. You come Sunday morning, we'll find that out. But people that don't have the Word, not standing on the Word, their foundation is based on sand. So here he is. His faith is based on what he sees, his physical senses. And he said in verse 26, And after eight days again his disciples were within. Now, no, here's a good example. If you ever wonder, if you ever wonder if God hears what you say, if Jesus hears what you say, Remember Thomas said, I won't believe unless I put my finger basically in the hole where the nail went through his hands, and I won't believe unless I put my hand in the side where the spear went. I won't believe. Now, if you ever wonder if God ever pays attention to what you're saying, notice when Jesus shows up, he goes right to Thomas, and he heard everything Thomas said. And he goes right to him and he approaches him. Because remember, Thomas said, I won't believe unless. So how many of you know? Jesus comes right. He's about to make him a believer. But it's faith that's based on what? What he sees. What he feels. 
and he reprimands him. And this is not the kind of faith. Bible faith is not based on your feelings. So he said, and again, after eight days, again, the disciples were with him and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Verse 27, then said he to Thomas, notice he said to all of them, he just showed up in the room, which tells you something about our glorified bodies. Apparently, we don't need to have somebody open the door for us. We want to come through. We can just come through. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't that going to be cool? See, if your house is locked and you forget the combination, ah, it's okay. I'll just walk through the door. Glory to God. No problem. But now notice, he speaks to all them, and he says, peace be unto you. Well, can you imagine being in your house? Can you imagine in this room where they're at, and bam, all of a sudden, there's Jesus. And you're like, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> Nobody knocked. Nobody heard the door. Nobody seen the door open. Bam, there he is. So what does he say to them? Well, could be a little startling to them. Would be a little startling to you. So he says, peace be unto you. Everybody say, peace be unto me. Does he want you to be in peace all the time? Absolutely. Don't let anything startle you. Nothing. But now notice, because it certainly will play tricks on your senses. He said, peace be unto you. And then what does he do in verse 27? He goes right to Thomas. Man, if, you gotta, if you're turning this ministry over to people, you've got to get them to believe you. They've got to be in faith. I said, they've got to be in faith. Then saith he to Thomas, what did he do? Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Obviously, Thomas must have done it. That's exactly what Thomas said. I won't believe unless I can do that. And he said, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. That's exactly what Thomas said. He must have done it. Now he's got all the physical proof, but this is not Bible faith. This is humanistic faith. Human faith says, I'll believe it when I see it. Bible faith says, I believe it and then I'll see it. Everybody say amen. So what happens? He does it. He thrusts his hand into his side, and he said, be not faithless. Don't be faithless. But believing. Everybody say, but believing. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. So his faith was based on what? His physical senses. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet, what church? And yet believe. Glory to God. So Jesus wasn't giving him a compliment, and he's telling you and I what we've got to come from this is your faith needs to be based on the Word. Don't base it on your senses. Don't base it on what you see. Don't base it on what you feel. Don't base it on what you hear. Always go to the Word and establish your faith based on that. So we know talking about that's not the kind of faith we want to now go to Romans the 14th chapter we've been talking about weak faith weak faith the second time of faith is weak faith weak faith we certainly don't want to have weak faith we want to have great faith we want to have faith that's unshakable I mean when a situation comes we want to be able to stand on the word of God believe and trust the word and pass the test and get the manifestation but notice in Romans the 14th chapter verse 1 it said, him that is weak in the faith. Everybody say weak in the faith. Now, notice he's talking to believers now. And the day that you got saved, Hebrews says that God gave every believer the day of the salvation the measure of faith. Everybody say the measure of faith. And that faith that he deposited into you, when you confess Jesus as your Lord by inviting him in to become Lord and Master, God jump-started all of us and gave us the measure of faith. That was great enough for you and I to become born again. It was great enough for God to do a heart surgery to take out our stony heart, our heart that our spirit that was dead in Christ, that was dead, or was dead, it was dead, it was separated from Christ, and God put a heart of compassion which is now alive unto God. So don't act like you don't have some faith that can't bring some miraculous things. But once again, we can be weak in the faith, and of course, how many of you know this? If you're not hearing the word on a routine, regular basis, is your faith going to get stronger or weaker? Your faith is going to get weaker. Because what happens when you're hearing the word and hearing the word and hearing the word? So then what comes? Faith comes by what? 
By hearing and what church? Hearing and hearing. Notice it doesn't say faith comes by having heard. It's present tense. We have to be careful when we hear something. Maybe we heard two weeks ago. We don't want to have the attitude or have the thought come to us. Oh, I've already heard that. No. Listen, faith's present tense. Faith is right now. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So here we find an individual who is weak in the faith. Now, let's go to Romans, the fourth chapter. Romans, the fourth chapter. And let's look at a man by the name of Abraham. And by the way, there are some tremendous blessings and benefits that you have that God promised Abraham. And so lots of times, once again, we come back to this, you know, sometimes people go, well, that's the Old Testament, and, and that was for the Jews. Well, God promised Abraham when the Jewish nation was not existent. He told him that he would be a blessing to all nations. Everybody say all nations. And he said, you're going to have children like the stars of the sky and the seas of the shore. Those are going to have a lot of children. And he told him that when they didn't have any children. And he was now in his 70s. And so the natural, he's thinking, how am I going to have children? Well, everybody say it with me. With God, all things are possible to him that what? Believes. So we got to get the believing part in. So the next time the enemy tells you you're not good enough, or you can't have it, just say, listen, I can have anything I want from God. All i got to do is get in faith on the subject. Now, how many know this? Obviously, you can't believe for just anything if it's not in the Word. you got that, church. So if you're asking for something that's not in the Word, then you can't have Bible faith for it because you can't get faith from something that you can't hear the Word on. So we have to remember that. But now notice, you go back and you study all these things, all these promises, and he even promised that the Holy Ghost would be given to all people who would be in faith. As a matter of fact, he calls us, and we'll look here just a little, he calls Abraham actually the father of all people who are of faith. Well, if I believe Jesus Christ, and I do believe he is my Lord and Savior, and I have faith to believe that, then listen, then I inherit all the promises that my spiritual father on earth, Abraham, that I can get they, they're, impo they're, they're, they're put to me, imparted to me, because of what Abraham did. And so sometimes, you know, it's amazing what the, what the devil will come up with and try to talk to you. Well, they're Jews. or Well, your faith is not big. And he, all these sideline things. And then, if you, listen, if that's not good enough, go over to Romans, the 11th chapter, and Paul said that you and I, who were wild olive branches, have been engrafted into the vine. So I qualify. Everybody say, I qualify. It's not, how many know Jesus died for the world? He didn't just die for the Jews. He died for the whole world. So, man, faith people, we get a lot of things that have been imparted to us. So it pays to be in faith. But notice here, if you would go to verse 13, Romans chapter 4, verse 13, and I want to talk to you about Abraham because it, we're looking at weak faith and we're seeing something about Abraham. And if you study his whole life, you're going to find out in the beginning there were times where Abraham did have weak faith. There were times where he wasn't a great man of faith. But notice, just don't quit. Everybody say it, just don't quit. You know, you just have to stay there. And remember, Abraham didn't have the Bible to go back and read to in his tent. He, didn't, he couldn't turn on any teaching tapes. Whatever words he got, they came directly from God, and that was it. And so we're not making excuses for him, but it certainly should tell us, listen, if he can come to the place of having great faith, then you and I can get there also, and your faith is going to be tested. Everybody say it with me. My faith is going to be tested. But listen, don't let it become weak faith. Weak faith doesn't produce very much. Matter of fact, we go back and we read the food incident that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Weak faith will actually limit you and hinder you. Because I gave the definition of the word weak, it means unable to bear a load. In other words, it's not going to be able to handle very much. And sometimes the enemy really, really applies the pressure on you and I, really puts the, tries to put the load on us, 
Sometimes the test will be fiery, and we want to overcome them. I would say, I want to overcome them. But you've got to have some faith that's going to stand there on the Word. So notice here in verse 13, Romans, the fourth chapter in verse 13. He said, for the promise that we should be the heir, that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. In other words, even though they obeyed the law, which is a good thing, the promise still didn't come to them. Why? Why didn't it come to them? Because they obeyed the law. Here's the reason why it came to them. He said the promise through, didn't come to them or to his seed through the law or obeying the law, but why did it come to them? But through the righteousness, everybody say the righteousness of faith. Why did these things come to them? Because of his faith. Why are things going to come to you and I? Because of our faith. Everybody say because of our faith. Notice something here very interesting. How many of you want to walk and be a righteous person? How many of you want to walk in your righteousness that God has input, input onto you? How many of you want to walk in that? Notice a faith person in God's eyes, because this is the Word of God, a faith person walking in faith, God looks at as a person who is in right standing with Him. You will never, ever hear God complaining about you standing on what God said. That's exactly what He wants us to do. And when we do that, we're in right standing because God's Word's incorruptible. And listen, when we're standing on His Word, we're always going to have right standing. Everybody say amen. So notice, He said in verse 14, For if they which are of the law, talking about the Old Testament, be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, for there is, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Well, how many of you understand this? The law couldn't get you saved. The Old Testament couldn't get you saved. It was a schoolmaster. And then he also talks about the second part, uh, talks about wherefore no law is, there is transgression. How many of you know if we don't have natural laws, if we don't have natural laws, then what are we going to have? We're going to have chaos. Can you imagine our world today without laws? Can you imagine what our world would be? It would be utter chaos, wouldn't it? Well, like it says, without laws, we're going to have transgression. We're going to have sin. He said, but the law worketh wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. In other words, there's no laws, and you really can't tell people they're doing wrong. Verse 16, wherefore... Therefore, it is of faith. Everybody say, of faith. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. That's interesting, faith and grace. Everybody say, faith and grace. Come on, I'm going to say it again, faith and grace. And the New Testament is many, many times it talks about the word grace or God's ability, what God has done for us. How do we walk in those things? By faith. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that which only is of the law or those referring to in the Old Testament, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham. How many of you have the same faith that Abraham does? Raise your hand because you got it. Absolutely. Now notice, so there's promises coming which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of how many nations? Many nations. Not just a nation, but many nations. Before him whom he believed, in other words, God believed, or Abraham believed what God said about him going to have children. And if you go back to, I believe, Genesis chapter 12 and then chapter 14, chapter 15, God said it over and over again, uh, you're going to have children, you're going to have children. And God said that when they were already past the age of bearing in the natural. And so here we find God says you're going to have children. How many know this? If God says you're going to have children, you ought to believe him. Ever say, I ought to believe him. Now, once again, I remember a young lady, a lady, actually, I believe she was an older lady, uh, coming through the prayer line of this one uh, minister, and uh, she said, I, I'm, you know, I'm really old, older age. She says, and 
And technically speaking, I can't, but I want to have children. And I see how God promised Sarah children. So I'm believing God. And he said, well, here's the problem with that. God spoke specifically to them, not to you. And now if God specifically tells you that, then that's fine. Are you with me, church? But once again, notice something here. We find about faith working. And he said, I have made thee. And by the way, if you go back and study that, uh, God told him what he was and what he was going to be and what his plans were when in the natural he had no children. God likes to tell us and call things the way he wants them. He loves that. If you go back and read this word, there, you're going to read promises in the New Testament. It'll say things to you, and your flesh will go, well, I, I, I'm not that way. That, that can't be me. And yet, when we look at scriptures, like it says, it calls us saints of God, and our mind will go, you ain't no saint of God. Do you know what you did the other day? How many of you know this? If we'll look at the word, God likes to look at us, and he wants us to look, look at the word, and he wants us to get caught up in what he says. You start calling yourself what God says about you, you'll find yourself starting to walk and act like what God called you to be. He needs your participation, though. He needs your will. So he said in verse 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God. Everybody say, Abraham believed God. Now notice, who quickeneth the dead. Notice, God who quickeneth the dead. Of course, Sarah's womb was incapable of having, it was dead. She wasn't dead physically, but she was incapable of having children. But once again, even if something is dead, are you with me, church? If something is dead and you begin to speak the Word of God over it. Remember, Jesus said, I believe in John 6, 63, He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That word life means the God kind of life. When you get the God kind of life operating in you, what do you do? You get the anointing. You get the manifestation. You get the life of God. Everybody say the life of God. By the way, the life of God will super exceed your flesh. It will super exceed anything in the natural, even if it's dead. So notice God is saying through, through Paul, and, and obviously Abraham and Sarah knew this, that their bodies were dead, they were incapable. He said, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, now notice, and calleth those things which be not, even though in the natural they're not that way, as though they were. In other words, he began to, God began to tell him how it was even when it wasn't in the natural that way. See, faith is now. Everybody say faith is now. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is. When is faith? Faith is present tense. Faith is right now. If you're going to talk faith words, then you're going to talk present tense. Let me give an incident. A lot of people believing for healing, listen carefully now, they say, God is going to heal me. Pay attention now. The problem with that is going to is not faith because that's hope. Hope is futuristic. Faith says in terms of now. Remember, you've heard me say this. Faith comes first and then the manifestation. Say that with me. Faith comes first and then the manifestation. Well, in order to get into faith and talk in terms of now, then I have to speak it like I have it now or believe I have it now when in the natural I don't. Bible faith says I have it. I have it. I believe I have it with my heart, but in the natural realm I don't. You got it, church. What, how, what did Thomas do? I'm not going to believe it unless I have it. Well, listen, you don't have to have any Bible faith once you got it. You need faith, first of all, to get it. Now, let's keep your finger there. Well, let's just continue reading. And he said in verse, who against hope? In other words, there was no expectation. There was no reason for him to look forward to having a child, not in, in a natural with him or with his wife, and it said, who against hope? In other words, even then there was no hope, he still believed in hope. See, nothing wrong with hope, but you don't, you don't, you don't receive 
with hope, you receive with faith. But you need hope. You certainly need to be expecting something, looking forward to something, like a lot of us. Uh, the Scripture talks about the hope of glory. How many of you can hardly wait to get to heaven? That's our, the Scripture talks about our hope. Why? It's our future. We're looking forward to it. But how many of you know, to get there, what do we do now? Now we walk by faith. Now we're walking by the Word. And then one day, our hope will bring, or our faith will bring hope to our sight. Glory to God. So let's read on, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of, of many nations, which God said, according to that which was spoken, who said it? God said it, so shall thy seed be, verse, eight, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, say this with me, Abraham was not weak in faith. Come on, ever say, Abraham was not weak in faith. Now, we can go back and we can look at the references where he was, but we're talking about concerning believing for the child. He finally got it together. He tried. Him and Sarah tried to make the plan of God come together. Hagar and Ishmael, how many remember the story? That didn't go so well, did it? Caused division in the home. Ended up telling them to leave. God gave a word to them. By the way, God gave them a word and a promise He would take care of them. He did. We don't have time to get into that. But anyhow, this is what happens when you try to help God rather than just stay in faith. Now, if God tells you to do something, absolutely. But God didn't tell them to do that. They decided they would help God out. And they said, and being not weak in faith. So we want to find out, okay, I don't want weak faith. So what did he do to not get himself or allow himself to get into weak faith? Begins to tell us. And being not weak in faith, notice, here's a key point. He considered not his own body now dead. In other words, his body was incapable of reproducing. Sarah, his wife, she was incapable. So when we talk about dead, they don't mean dead physically. No, that was still her and her. They were incapable of the two of them coming together and producing a child. But yet God said, just believe me. Everybody say, just believe me. And so notice something about people that have weak faith, and people that have great faith. We see something. Abraham obviously knew his age. He knew his wife. If you remember when the angels came to Sarah, and they talked to Sarah about having uh, a child, what did she do? Didn't she chuckle and laugh? Why? Doesn't sound like she was in great faith. But notice talking about Abraham here now. What did Abraham do? He didn't consider his body. If you're going to not get into a weak faith, you're going to have to not consider your body. Are you with me, church? Now, when I say that, you have to make sure that you are in Bible faith, not mental assenting. Are you with me? It's good to be stubborn, but you want to make sure you're in faith. You need to know that you know that you know that you know that you know. No doctor in those days, anyhow, was going to find a way to enable them to have children. But notice he didn't consider his body. How many of you know your body has a lot of feelings, emotions, has a lot of passions, a lot of desires? I'm sure the thought came to him all the time, you're too old. You can't have a baby. Your wife is too old. You guys can't have a baby. I know what God said, but that was way back then. And now, it's been almost 20-some years, still hadn't come to pass, so maybe you missed it. This is how the enemy does. He wants you to get into humanistic reasoning. He wants you to try to figure this out. How much is available to you from God, if you'll believe? All things. Everybody say all things. Everything's available to you if you'll believe God. How am I going to believe God? Well, I need to hear God. I need to hear His Word and hear His Word and hear his word, and hear his word, and hear his word. So I have to be careful considering my body. Well, if I can't consider my body, what am I going to consider? Go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews. 
Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And notice something here. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Is your body going to give you trouble? Oh, my. It'll give you lots of trouble. Your mind will give you trouble. I mean, the enemy will throw thoughts at your mind like a machine gun. He'll do whatever he can to get you out of faith, to get your faith weakened. He wants you to look at the natural realm. He wants to rehearse it to you. He wants you to take his thoughts. He wants you to think the way he's thinking. It's always going to lead you away from the word. The enemy knows the word will work. We just have to be thoroughly persuaded it works. We have to know it. And so notice here in Hebrews, what did I tell you to turn to? Chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Yeah, notice something here in verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse 23. Hebrews 10 verse 23. If you have it, say, I got it. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 says, let us hold fast. Everybody say, hold fast. Come on, everybody say, it, hold fast. Let us hold fast to what? Let us hold fast the profession of our what, church? Of our faith. Do you need to hold fast to you speaking your faith out of your mouth? Do you need to keep saying it and keep saying it and keep saying it? I mean, man, you keep saying it and you keep saying it. I mean, even if the enemy doesn't come, I'll just tell you, your flesh will come to you and your flesh will go, how many more times are you going to say that? Your mind will go, do we have to say it again? Then the enemy, he'll sit there and he'll go, don't you know you're just wasting your time? Now, how many of you know this? Here's a real clue that you and I need to be able to decipher who's speaking to us. If you have thoughts coming to your mind, you want to pay attention to this. If you want to have thoughts coming to your mind, it's probably not God because God is a spirit and he speaks to your spirit. It's the enemy that comes to your mind, bombards your mind, questions the word, bringing doubt to you. He wants you to get into human reasoning. He wants you to figure it out. Listen. If we have the Word of God, if God said it, everybody say it with me. If God said it, I believe it. And what, church? And that settles it. Can God lie? He cannot lie. So I have to determine that Romans chapter 3, verse 4 says, let God be true and every man. Notice you have to let that. It's up to you. You've got to let God be true. And no matter what anybody else says, as far as they're concerned, they're lying. Now, that doesn't mean all men are lying. But that just simply means you're not going to choose an opinion over what God says. This word always becomes a priority in your life. I got pages falling out. All right. But now notice, he said, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without what, church? Without wavering. Are you at verse 23? So when you start confessing and speaking the word of God, and it doesn't happen, and a lot of time that you think is reasonable and acceptable, which, by the way, don't get hooked up and don't put things on a watch. Don't put things on a clock. Just get hooked on the Word. Stay with the Word. Stay with the Word. Stay with the Word. Stay with her. I have heard so many people down through my years of ministry, if they're praying and believing God for something and it doesn't happen, this is what they come up with. Well, it must have not been the will of God. Well, that tells me you weren't in very good faith or very strong faith. If God said it, believe it no matter what. Come on, church. And how many of you know God can bring it around again and again and again? I get amazed at people that say that, but yet the same God that's controlling the situations that they want to come to pass, but he never makes them go to church. I think that's kind of funny. How many of you know, I believe going to church is very, very important. And why wouldn't he make them go to church? Well, because he's not in control as much as you think. Actually, your faith is what's controlling, or lack of faith, is what is controlling or not controlling your life. But he said, verse 23, so let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Will you be tempted to waver? Are you going to be tempted to waver? Look at your neighbor and go, you're going to be tempted to waver. 
when you get into faith. Remember, Satan is going to come and try to steal that word. Remember the parable of the sower? If he doesn't steal the word out of you immediately while you hear it, then he's going to bring the cares of this life to you. He's going to bring the lust of other things into your life. What does that mean? He's going to bring things into your life that you may really like, that he wants you to put them before God, before the Word, and before serving God. Everybody say amen. The deception of riches. Nothing wrong with having riches. God wants us to be blessed, but sometimes we're doing things for the wrong motive. I remember years gone by, I think I was assistant pastor at that time, uh, there was a sermon, actually it wasn't a sermon, well it was a sermon, but it was written in a Kenneth Copeland magazine by Gloria Copeland, and I think the title of the sermon was called Potato Couch, or Couch Potato, and the whole sermon was about people picking and choosing their priorities, and her point was, be careful that you don't put so many things into your life that they become before God and your relationship and serving God. You have all these things that you have done that you have got activities involved in, and now you can't make it to church half the time. Now you can't read your Bible. Now you can't pray. Now you can't do the things that you're supposed to do. But remember, how many know there's the enemy sitting back and watching, and he's waiting for a time when you're spiritually weak? Because he's not coming for a time when you're strong. He's coming from a time when you're weak. Test is coming. And if you're not ready, you're going to be overtaken. And now we like to blame God, but really we can't blame God because we're the ones that haven't been diligent. So let's read on. He said, faith without wavering, for he is faithful. Everybody say, God is faithful. Now what is he saying? Well, why is he saying, for he is faithful, that promise? Because we have to know that if God said it, then it will surely come to pass. But you just have to stay with the word. Stay with the Word, stay with the Word, stay with the Word, stay with the Word. Everybody say, stay with the Word. God is faithful that promised you what you're holding fast to. Now, go to Hebrews, one more scripture, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. For he didn't consider, maybe Abraham didn't consider his body. You're going to be tempted to look at your body. You're going to be tempted. Man, there'll be feelings show up. I, I was talking to my wife today, and while I was talking to her, I was just kind of leaned over, and, and all of a sudden I had this sharp pain, like somebody took a knife and just kind of stabbed me back here. And I went, oh. And I know what the enemy wanted me to do. The enemy wanted me to think about it, and he wanted me to say something unscriptural to open the door up, and I didn't do it. I said, no, thank you, Father, I'm the healed. I shared this with you a couple of, couple of years ago. Uh, the Lord began to minister to me about sneezing. And he said, if you'll, every time you sneeze, come back with the Word of God, you'll shut the door for a lot of sickness and disease. Because, see, the enemy, he'll bring something by your nose. Your body will react to it. You'll sneeze. Sometimes we'll have thoughts. I've even had people come to me, and I know people have come to you, particularly now in the last two years. I mean, man, if you were standing in the line, people wearing masks or somebody when the mask situation, some of the masks were coming off, and somebody sneezed. I mean, I, I, I remember how people turn around and they give you the evil eye, like, oh, my, what's wrong with you? See, the enemy's got people set up. He's got them set up to think somebody sneezes, oh, my, I may get sick. So what are we going to do? We're going to combat that with the Word. Ever say, I'm going to say what the Word says. Ever say, by his stripes. I am healed. Say it again. By his stripes, I am healed. Now notice Hebrews chapter 12. A couple more verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Talking about Hebrews chapter 11. There's a great cloud of witnesses of faith people. Now remember, we're talking about a considered not. What am I going to consider? I don't want to waver. Well, we know one way not to waver is to hold fast your confessions. Keep speaking the word. But now notice, he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. See, sometimes it's not sin that's, that's coming against us and weighing us down. Sometimes it's just weights of things 
that we shouldn't be involved in that are not necessarily sin, but they're taking up our time. They're not allowing us to fellowship with God. It's slowing us down. Oh, the enemy likes it. He likes the diversion. He said us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Are you in a race today? If you don't know it, you are in a race today. Everybody say it. I'm in a race today. Now, we have a man in our, in our, our uh, congregation tonight that he used to run marathons. A marathon is at 26 point, is it exactly 26 or 26, 26.2 tenths. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking probably after 26 miles, probably that last two tenths is like, man, I just want to get it over with. But see, we're in a race. You're in a race. Everybody say, I'm in a race. Well, what am I going to do? Because I don't want to get into sin and I don't want to have weights. I don't want to make it harder for me. I want to be able to run my Christianity with as much efficiency as I can. I don't want to make it harder for me. I want to be able to be streamlined. I don't want to have a bunch of things hanging on me. I remember in basketball, uh, when I played uh, in the Grove Lake, we played in the lake in the Grove for, when I worked for Grove, and uh, I remember I used to wear these ankle weights, and I'd wear the ankle weights. Of course, the idea is you wear the ankle weights, but when you warm up and you take them off, you're supposed to be able to jump a little higher. Well, I found out the first couple of times I put them things on there, I thought, man, my feet are slow. I mean, it's like all of a sudden you got this, it's like, wow. And, and it was only like three or four, it wasn't like it was like 15 or 20. It's a couple of pounds, and you're thinking, man, I mean, can a couple pounds really make that? Well, I found out once I took them off. I mean, I can't say I felt like Superman, but I, it definitely, and sometimes I wonder if it wasn't more psychological or if it really helped me. But anyhow, I took them off. Man, now my feet feel light. I like that idea. That's how we should be running our race. Not a bunch of things holding on to us. Not a bunch of things weighing us down. Not bogged down by the, listen, by the cares of this life. They'll weigh you down. They'll get you to worrying and fretting. They'll pull you down. They'll slow you down. And true will tell you to run the marathon. It is not fun having extra weight. It's not fun. So what are we going to do? Looking at verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus. Everybody say, look unto Jesus. In this race and this walk of faith, who do I need to keep my attention on? I need to keep looking unto Jesus. Everybody say, looking unto Jesus. Now, let me see it in a broader term. Jesus is also defined as the Word. I need to keep looking at the Word. I need to keep looking at Jesus. I need to keep looking at the Word. I need to keep looking at Jesus. Why? I'm in a race. If I'm in a race, then I'm going to make my choices based on what Jesus would do. Otherwise, I may make wrong choices. It may make my race hard. Let's read on. Almost done. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our what church? What's he the finisher and the author of? Our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Notice the cross wasn't joy, but the joy before him. He said, man, I'm going to...